What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Blue River Bow Hunting Podcast, episode 85. Dylan, how's them uh, food plots in Tennessee turning out for you, bud? They're dry. Needing some more rain. We, we got a little bit of a teaser last night, um, but I think there's some rain in the next 15 days, I'm hoping, that comes through. But they're looking pretty good for yeah, being a drought. For, so. for not having much rain, that does look pretty good. So I've got high hopes that what's not, like the patches that haven't came in yet, they'll really uh, thrive once we get some water on them. So I've, I've got the big water tank. <laughs> if uh, we don't get a good amount of water on it by, I'd say, next weekend, I'll I'll start watering with the water tank, I guess. Yeah, you might have to do that. I know it gets pretty dry down there in Tennessee sometimes. It's, it's rough. <laughs> well, uh, this week's episode with uh, Ron Howard. I've been trying to get Ron on for a little yes, bit. Uh, and He was uh, teasing me a little bit down at uh, Triple O saying, get me on, get me on. So, uh, Ron Howard, what's going on, dude? What's up, man? Good to be on. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you hopping yeah. on and uh, taking some time out of your date. Just coming off uh, 724s. Yes, uh, he's been all over the country helping people out with uh, some with some organs. But uh, for somebody that doesn't know you, Ron, introduce yourself a little bit. Sure. So uh, Ron Howard, um, 51 years young. Um, I'm a United States Navy veteran. Um, retired from um, fire service, firefighter paramedic uh, for over 20 years. I retired back in 2020. Um, uh, I've been married to my high school sweetheart, working on uh, 32 years now. We have three boys um, that we uh, raised in the outdoors. Uh, we now have five grandkids, two girls, finally got two girls, three boys. You know, that next generation. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. My oh, oldest grandson sure. killed, his, killed his first buck or his first deer uh, this past hunting season. Um, you know, and I just love uh, chasing whitetail. And Brett, you know me. Um, I'm uh, ate up with them long beards, bro. Oh, for so, sure. <laughs> uh, that's that's uh, that's a little bit about me. And like Brett said, uh, just came off seven days of working. Uh, my my part time job. Uh, I work for a company through Gift of Life, uh, running organs and, and tissue uh, samples for Gift of Life all over all over the place. So, yeah, me and Ron have uh, had the pleasure of sharing. Uh, what was it? two two turkey camps two. this year together one last year yeah. first time meeting last year and uh ron ron is such a fun guy to have yeah. around camp high energy you know if, if, if he gets a bird you're gonna know about it because he's get getting a little fired yeah. up yeah. <laughs> yeah, i think he gets the nickname uh hollywood howard which is yeah, yeah. it's awesome man it's so cool to see you uh, you know get a bird and, and see the footage from all that man it's it, it's it's pretty cool I would say if anybody's as ate up as me and Dylan is with long beards, it's definitely you. Uh, yeah, we should you have know, had you on for long beards, really. Yeah, yeah. I tried to get on when uh, when you were talking about turkeys, you know, and uh, I used to live in uh, Tennessee, Dylan, and uh, hope to get back down there one day. Um, but I know it's a white tail uh, uh, podcast, but uh, yeah, I just I just love chasing them long beards. I've only been doing it for about four or five years now, uh, and I'm 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 made up with it. You know? Yeah, you got this. This year, you killed what four birds? Your, just, my, your best my biggest year? year, I killed four. I, I tagged out in Tennessee, um, and then uh, I, I came back to uh, Triple O, killed another double beard in Triple O, and then uh, you know uh, what happened in Michigan. So we killed what? Uh, uh, how many birds? And I think it was five hours, six, six birds, birds like, in four uh, hours or something plus, like that. Five hours, so. <laughs> oh man, that's crazy. Well, I mean, it. Uh, I've been hurting turkey for a very long time, and I think the each season that rolls up, I'm like, hey, I can't be more excited than I was last year. And now the older you get, the more experience you'll have under your belt and the more excited you get. And it just – it's – I can't believe that I still get this pumped up for it. But, I mean, I'm it's counting crazy. I'm counting yeah. deer down. I'm counting turkey down. Um, I mean, me and Brett's already talked about next year's turkey season. We're talking Absolutely. about this deer season. And then it's just – does it ever stop? Because no, it hasn't no. for me. I about, no. I about crashed my work vehicle a couple times this week. There's on my route to to and from where I dropped my work vehicle off. Uh, there's still birds strutting for hens around me. Wow, that is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Putting on a show today. There was there's a field, uh, and I was talking to Vic. Um, and back in the springtime, the same field. There's about seven strutters with with a handful of hens, and they're still they were still out there today. Wow. I'll be knocking on some doors here real soon. <laughs> so. Absolutely. <laughs> and and that's uh that's in michigan where you're at yeah yeah man i, I don't know what, what 
because I've been ate up with long beards for since I was 13, 14 years old, and I'm just south of Michigan, and it never like that state never came up in conversation when it when it came to turkeys, and I, I get that question a lot from people that I have a turkey tattoo, so they're like, "Where's your favorite place to turkey hunt?" and Michigan is – it's so birds, hard man. to freaking yeah. – it's its so hard to beat that. Don't, don't get me wrong, Dylan. Tennessee is very badass, trust Tennessee. me. Absolutely. But there's just something different because, you know, the times that we – me and Ron get to go up and hunt Michigan, it's – I mean, it's well, well over in Tennessee. You're talking the end of May, the beginning of June, and yeah. they are still hammering. Fired up. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It's awesome, man. What part of Tennessee do you come down and hunt? Uh, I hunt uh, – so um, – I'm not sure. You know where Crossville is? Yeah. So I lived uh, just east of Crossville in a town called Grandview, Spring City. About, about I know where halfway, Spring City is. Like, kind of be, between Knoxville and Nashville. I'm closer to uh, Knoxville. Okay, yeah. Uh, Spring City is roughly about an hour and ten from me. Okay, yep, yep. Um, so I, not, not I, again, far I, at all. I, uh, I cut my teeth down there. I moved down there. didn't know anybody, and I, I pretty much only hunted TVA land. And uh, mm-hmm. my first year down there was they were still three birds that year. And uh, I tagged out on TVA land by myself, pressured land. Um, it was a blast, man. Uh, this year, I co- a combination, private and TVA. I got a buddy down there now that I met before we moved back. So, yeah, I, I love it down there. You can yeah, find good deer out there, too. I mean, There's good deer. He's he's uh, so he's he's been pretty successful to kill some nice bucks down there. And I didn't realize it, but he uh, he hunts a lot of the Kutsu flats. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just finds monsters in that cutsu, and I, I didn't even realize that that was that was a thing. You know what I mean? I've heard they love to summer in the. They, they do. That's where he does his preseason scouting in the summertime. He finds them in them flats, and then uh, he goes and hunts them up. You know, and, and the, during the rut, and he's he's been pretty successful with some nice. I'm surprised there's some nice deer down there. Mm-hmm. Well, see, so once you get like to that area and kind of branch further down, you get into more ag land. Like you get yeah. some farmers who actually have an adequate amount of actual ag, you know. Um, but yeah, I've heard about the kudzu. I've I've heard that like a dude scouted it and then got down in the cut, and he said it was like tunnels just everywhere. Oh yeah, like yeah. They were just running around like you know, almost like moles back there. And I was like, yep. that is crazy. That is crazy. Kind of the same conversation. Uh, If you were to ask me, you know, about Tennessee whitetail, I'd probably be like, prior to knowing you and getting to know what you do for the whitetails in your part of the state, you know, it's like I would have been like, yeah, I'm passing on that. I'll probably try someplace else. But I'm super excited to come down uh, there at the end of August and do the velvet hunt with you. Uh, Super, you know, like the day, each day it gets the the amp just keep just gets getting worse and worse and worse. (laughs) Like because we talk about it nonstop too. Plus he's you know he's putting all these uh, food plots in and uh, habitat for his whitetails and um, from just looking at that just gets me even more hyped up we we definitely do and, and i've stepped up the you know i'm not just calling it the strut zones anymore we're calling it the rut and strut zones um i went through and i drug probably three foot on both sides of those what would you say they're they're what about eight ten foot normally yeah like the something one like that so yeah. i've went through and i've done you know another three foot on both of that and i've implemented keeping them like i keep dragging them because the turkey with the babies have uh, i guess we started cutting that food plot in and um i always wait as late as i can to do food plots because i have a ton of turkey that nest in my fields um and i noticed when we were cutting that i had a, a hen nest and she had nine eggs all of them had you know they'd been out for probably about a week or two so we disked and then i disked all the rut and strut zones and the next day she was out there I guess they were picking up worms or chasing grubs in that fresh turned dirt. And she had nine, nine little babies with her. So nice. they've made it up until this point. And I, I think that turning that dirt for those little, you know, pulse to be able to get in there and flip and, and try. And then the deer have been burning it up. I don't know um, if it's just easier transitioning for them with, with the leaves on right now, or, but I can't keep the dough. I mean, you, you ride one of those trails and you're seeing four or five dough, about every time you turn a corner on that thing was that so, the was that the bearded hen that had the nest no i've not seen her so i don't know where she's went to nest um there's two of them there's one that's got a real thick beard and then one that's just got a pencil beard and i had her at four yards this year i couldn't believe how close she got to me but she was so fired up she came in to fight 
and that's awesome. she, you know, it, it, it's just been, it's been one heck of a turkey season and all this work that we've done up until this point is paying off. So now it's got my mind just running even, even faster. And like, well, I was out there on the Bobcat and it was like 10 30 the other night, just had the, the headlamps on, you know, burning that midnight fuel, but it, uh, it all pays off, I think. So, absolutely. you know, it's good, I'm to, see, get, it's good to see when it pays off too. You know what I mean? It is. All that it, hard work. It's, it's neat to just try to build something in your mind and be like, well, I've hunted for this long. Um, in my opinion, they're going to do this. And then you go and build something and they're like, they're doing exactly what you want them to do. And yeah. it's not just to kill them out of, you know, I mean, if we kill a big buck up there this year, that's awesome. Sure. But if I have healthy, healthy doe and I'm getting Absolutely. the fawns, stuff like that. And, and what I've done is I sent Brett a video the other day. I, they just cut hay and we left probably about six acres of high grass and i'll take the bobcat and i'll go through that and i'll drop bucket and drag you know just not rip it up but i'll lay the grass over so that the little turkey and the fawns can run those trails and not be exposed in a wide open field um and that's paying it's just like little things that people don't think about those deer will just eat it up yeah that's awesome well, uh, Ron, you just got back from, uh, you know, not too long ago from uh, Canadian Bear Hunt. Let's, oh, yeah. let's hear some details and, uh, you know, kind of play it out for us. Well, I'll start by saying, so I was on my way home and my wife, she's apologizing to me. I'm like, what are you sorry for? She goes, you didn't get a bear. I'm like, no, you don't understand. It was, as far as going on a hunt and not coming home with an animal, probably the best hunt hands down I've ever been on, Right. And, and Vic's been talking it up since before COVID. This this has been been a long time in the making. Vic was uh, setting us up. So Vic has been going up there for years. Um, it's an outfit, but Vic's like family with these folks up there. So mm-hmm. um, he, he gets like his, his certain week he gets in the spring and in the fall. So he's been trying to set this up for years. COVID hit. We couldn't go. Technically, I've been on a bear hunt um, prior. My first bear hunt, um, um, Victor... Uh, took me to Arkansas um, with Claire. Uh, she's got some guy that's got some private land down there. Didn't see any bear. Good time there too. But this this was my first Canadian bear hunt, right? Um, so so and and it it Vic talked it up and it was he didn't disappoint. Um, we we had I caught some of the biggest pike, biggest bass I've ever caught in my life. Um, of course, from from um, water to pan, you know, mm-hmm. ate them up right there. Um, spent delicious. a week in country, no cell service, no electricity, no Wi-Fi, no internet, and man, I didn't miss it. You know, we of course we had a generator if we wanted to charge our batteries and and things of that nature. We had lake water pumped in the house, uh, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so my second sit, I saw my first bear on stand. Uh, Chris Labars was filming for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was uh, about 12 foot off the ground, set up to bow hunt. And I didn't even take my bow off the hook. I want this bear to come in and get in the bait. He didn't quite come in. He set up about, he hung up about 30 yards out, you know, bow in hand, um, gun in hand. Maybe I could have taken a shot, but I really wanted him to get in the bait, get that, you know, that footage. Yeah. Um, he, he went at us a little bit. He went off. It was the only bear I saw from Stan. Um, of course, I was jacked up. You know, Chris, oh, yeah. bear, 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 you know. Uh, of course, I was jacked up. Didn't see another bear on Stan, but uh, I chased trail cam pictures right chase chase trail cams and, and bait that was hit um had i stayed on any one of the four stands i sat the whole week i'd have killed something you know so we had we had some active bait sites um but man so the cabin is situated basically it's a road that cuts up through uh, the, br- the bush right mm-hmm. there's lakes everywhere cabin set up and there's lake on both sides you could you could shore fish and catch fish um, they have a couple little aluminum boats there with, with little uh, nine horse motors. You can buzz around the lakes. Um, so the guide, the, the outfitter brought his boat up in um, a couple days into the trip and we went down to the big lake. I mean, just miles and miles of lake. Didn't see a soul on a lake. Um, fished that lake. At one time we filled the live well in like 30 minutes. Uh, you know, it's just crazy. But as far as like, like I said, not, not coming home with an animal, it was it was it was one of the best hunts I've ever been on, you know. It, good eating. Uh, they had a so they've got a um, it was a sauna they built on wheels, right? Mm-hmm. And you feed it full of wood, obviously get the sauna of piping hot. Go in there, throw water on the rocks, just like a like a regular sauna. And you got five gallon buckets of lake water in there, getting hot. And that's that's how you bath. 
Oh, that's you know what awesome. I mean? So it was like it was rustic, but it was it was uh, you know kind of high class a little bit. I mean, that's uh, yeah, pretty like pretty cool though. I mean, that oh, just the cool. nostalgia of having to do something like that, and like you said. It would be weird not having cell service, uh, you know, for your family that's back in the States. But then again, it would be a freaking blessing at the same time because you don't have to deal with any of it. They had um, what they called the phone booth, right? You go up a couple miles up the road and a high point on the road, and there was literally just a Canadian flag stuck in the road. And you could get cell service there. So if you needed to call home, send a quick text. Um, and that a, a couple of the sites, the bait sites, you would, you would pass that. So you'd stop, update. And then Vic had like a, um, like a Garmin kind of like a sat phone where he could just send and receive text only. So mm-hmm. for emergency, we had something. Okay. Um, so you weren't completely out of touch, but uh, it, it was, i tell you what, it was relaxing not having that distraction. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, it, 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 it made for a real, uh, you know, it was me, Vic, his son, Antone, Chris LaBarge came over for a couple days. And then um, the guy who baits and then the guy that runs the outfit, Jody came up and stayed in camp with us too. So, it just gave a really good time for me to get to know Jody and, and, and the guys from the outfit and then spend some time with Chris that I don't get to a lot cause he's up in Canada already. Yeah. Um, you know, get to know Antone, you know, Victor son a little bit more. So that distraction taken away allowed for some of that, you know, sit around the campfire, tell some stories, you know what I mean? So it, it was a good time. Oh, I can imagine those stories around that campfire were oh, yeah. pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah. And then of course, if you don't fill your tag, that tag's good. We're going back in the fall. We're going back in August anyways. So. Yeah, you're going, I believe, the same time it's, it's, period it's, that I'm going on the Velvet Hunt. Okay, yeah. Because I, yeah. talk, I talked to Vic. He was trying to – he's been over at the house a couple times, and he was trying to talk me into uh, the the August trip. And I'm like, let me look here. I think I got something going on. And yeah. sure enough, it was when I'm going to be down at Dylan's for the, the Velvet Hunt, which – I'm already so locked in on that. Oh, I, I'm, sure. I'm ready for that. For but sure. I, I'm ready for a bear hunt because that's one of the high things on my bucket list. I want to. I want to go. And it would. Well, I would be. Get you up there. Oh Vic yeah. Get you up there, and there, I guarantee you, I'll be there too. Because I, I told Vic at the, the first trip, he's like, "Well, I go every spring and fall. If you want to go, he didn't even get it out of his mouth. I said, I'm going. I don't care if I kill. I'll come <laughs> up and film somebody. I'll come up and cook for somebody. I don't care. I'm going, man. It was a good time. That sounds like it, man. Uh, kind of brings me into my next uh, kind of questions is uh, Crimson Trail. Kind of sounded like a Crimson Trail uh, kind of outfit, you know, like all you guys going together. Talk about how you got involved in, in Crimson Trail and, and how everything's playing out. All right. So I, I kind of started filming the moment my kids started hunting with me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I, a, lot of, a lot of dads do that, I'm sure. And it was a cheap camera. Um, some of it's probably even on DVD now. I don't even know how to get some of that transferred over. But so I, I just started running a camera. When my kids became old enough to hunt, I didn't hunt. I sat with them. You know what I mean? So I filmed them. Um, as they grew older and and I hunted more on my own, then I got into the self-filming. Um, and not to start a show or anything. I just filmed. You know, I like I like to archive that stuff. Yeah. And then it was through the Nexus program. You talk about that a lot on here. Mm-hmm. I met Chris and then Kurt Reynolds, who isn't a, he's not an ambassador anymore. He's up in Canada as well. Um, and just through the Nexus program is really, you know, and we can touch base on that too at some point, but that's really what has allowed a lot of my opportunities is just meeting guys, social media, like me and Vic didn't even know each other personally until probably four or five years ago at, at um, the triple O turkey hunt. And, mm-hmm. and it was just through the Nexus program. But so anyway, Kurt and, and Chris invited me over. They were trying to start something up in Canada called Cedar Ridge Outdoors. We did that for a little while. We, we have a YouTube channel. We had a YouTube channel. Um, Chris uh, um, or Kurt hooked up with another guy and they kind of broke off and did their own thing. So it was just me and Chris for a little bit there. Me and Chris were trying to get um, you know Cedar Ridge Outdoors built up. And I had collaborated with Vic over the years anyway. Vic is film me uh, a lot of hunts i've been on crimson trail um through vic filming me anyway so it was kind of a natural transition vic reached out to me and chris individually and asked us if we'd be interested in just joining crimson trail and of course i'm like man yeah yeah just say the word um and chris kind of the same thing but chris wanted to talk to me first make sure i was all right with i was like chris let's go man let's let's join up we're already there we already we've done a kentucky hunt together um me and um uh, vic have done numerous you know between bear turkey and other hunts me and vic have already kind of collaborated so it was just like a natural transition to join vic's team and it's just like been awesome since um i think they have we have 
So between Chris, Vic, Brian Wenzel, and um, John Ruiz, we have four editors um, just knocking it out of the park. So, um, yeah, that's really what how me and Chris got on Crimson Trail. That's awesome. Yeah, you guys are doing a, a hell of a job. I, I actually, I, I go back and watch. I, I think the other day I had it on there, and I was watching. I watched um, turkey hunts from the, the the first year we 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 met in Michigan. I uh, watched those two episodes that you guys put together on that, and then uh, I think it was Brian's. I was watching, uh, and just everybody does a, a remarkable job with editing, and it's kind of cool that you have multiple editors like that to kind of put their own spin on things it's nice man as being a whole own, you know yeah they all have their own spin and their own perspective on it so you get you know you see what crimson trail puts together as a whole but then you see the individual editing and, and it's just it just i, I like the, the storytelling man really is what it's all about mm-hmm. and like i said earlier i, I don't have to kill I, I i will come film you uh and be just as stoked about a, a kill you know and that's you know chris came over he filmed me Anton chases Victor around all the time and mostly uh, films. Every time I've hunted with Vic, he's he's never killed. I don't know how many years he's not killed a turkey in Indiana, but he's filmed me killing turkey. But that's what mm. it's about, you know. Oh, for uh, sure. You know, coming together in, in our Michigan thing. You know, that's mm. a what that's a three, four different team collaboration right there. You know what yeah. I mean? And and we're just all handing cameras off, filming, getting people <laughs> yeah, birds, right. and just handing. Uh, you know, the SD cards around and, and, you know, guys are just putting episodes together, man. That's, that's what it's all about. Absolutely, man. That, that whole, I mean, I guess we could talk about that. Cause you know, I, I've talked to Victor on here about it before. Um, that camp up there with <laughs> the mid state outdoors guys, I cannot emphasize that enough. It is incredible. They do an incredible job of hosting, uh, putting you on birds, uh, the camaraderie, the the food. I mean, it's all like next level on every aspect oh, of it. It's it's unbelievable to those guys. I I just couldn't imagine not being a part of that now. Like, oh man, meeting those guys the way I did, which was through social media. Uh, me and uh, Zach kind of trading hunts, and and then they had a turkey camp, and we kind of. I went there twice actually. The first year I went up there. And then he was like, hey, next year I'm thinking about kind of, you know, building this up a little bit, uh, inviting Vic and Ron and, and some of those guys. I'm like, let's do it. And then yeah. to turn it in what it is today, it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, for sure. It was a good time. And we're actually uh, – so me, Vic, and John Ruiz, uh, they're, they're coming to my place, and then we're shooting up there for Zach's um, 3D shoot oh, uh, yeah. in July. So that'll be a good time. Absolutely. We're gonna we're gonna all take our uh, our our recurves up there and shoot some traditional. So that'll be a good time. I'm in, I want to get into uh, traditional archery. Um, what's a good kind of way to just to kind of get my 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 feet wet and, and try it out and see if I like it? I'd say cheap. Like when I first uh, got interested in it, um, I they so there's a there's a recurve called a Samic Sage, I believe is the name of it. It's like an entry level, but a lot of guys even hunt with it. Um, it's super affordable and it's, it's, it's plenty of bow to get, to get, to get into it. And then I actually, there's a lot of companies that make a very similar bow. So one year I bought me, my wife and my son one for Christmas one year. And I bought a, uh, it's a PSE Nighthawk, I think it is. And it's, it's the same base as that Sam Sage. And, uh, that's all I shoot. I didn't, I think I spent like 80 bucks for it or 90 bucks for it or something like that. Uh, I make my own arrows, um, and you know, that's, you don't need to spend a ton of money to get into it to see if you're going to like it. And then, you know, YouTube school, of YouTube, like Victor says, you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Uh, and that's really where I've learned to do most everything, you know? <laughs> right. Me too. Uh, Dylan, you ever thought about getting into some traditional? <clears throat> Actually, when I was younger, um, probably like 14, 15, my uncle gave me and my cousin two recurve bows and they were pretty nice. And man, you talk about wearing them out. We shot and shot and shot, but we were not strong enough to unstring them. Right. And, and I, we just, we let it, we left them strong and they warped. Um, so I I would love to get another recurve. I had an absolute, it's so addicting to just shoot with no sights and shoot and shoot. And and like, you're just never, you get one good shot and you're like, okay. And you just want to hone in on that. Um, which is kind of like, you know, shooting recurve is a lot like shooting, bow fishing kind of because you don't have you're yeah. going straight off just aim and yeah. um i would absolutely i would absolutely love to 
to get back into a recurve. Um, I never shot anything with it. We just shot targets. Um, but I know a, a guy locally here, and he he hunts mainly recurve now with for deer, and he he's a he's an absolute killer. But uh, he makes it look really enticing how close they get, like how fast he is with it. You know, right. um, I would uh, yeah, I I would love to get one. So uh, I'm talking about close. I'm yeah, talking about close. So, so Vic's trying to kill his bear with with his dad's recurve. I don't know if you know that story. Yeah, so. he told that story on here, and he's told Man, me personally. Man, he was he was literally his his last setup on the ground, like six seven steps from the Ooh. barrel. Wow, yeah, that'd be wild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he's 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 got in there real close. Now he's gotten really good. He's been shooting his like crazy. I I had hunted with mine one time. I hunted turkey with it at Triple O one year. And uh, I took my shotgun out with me. I was, it was crazy. So I'm self filming, trying to kill something with a recurve. And uh, I had this, I had this Tom fired up on the limb, hits the ground, come right into my decoys. I barely got my camera on. He's knocks my Jake off the pole. I mean, he's just tearing my decoys up. Right. So he comes around my decoy and I, I go full draw and I'm going to Texas heart shot him. Right. <laughs> and uh, I let go and I go right over top of him. He jumps up, takes off, and he comes back into my decoys. I set that recurve down and grab my shotgun. Grab the gun. <laughs> yeah. Woo! <laughs> I don't blame that you. Was a, that was the one time I uh, I tried killing something with my recurve. So I'd like, I'm going to try to um, – I'm going to at least probably doe hunt with it this year. I'd like to kill a deer with it from the ground. We'll see. I've been shooting it every day because um, we're going to that 3D uh, mm. shoot. So I'm been shooting it, getting pretty good with it at like in that 15 – just in, within 20 yards, 15 yards – I've gotten pretty pretty decent with it, but it's it's you got to shoot it every day, man. With a recurve, yeah. it's repetition, muscle memory. You know, there's a lot of lot of work that goes into getting good with a recurve, especially what, if you're going to go out and try to kill an animal with it. Oh yeah, what what poundage are you shooting? So my so the one I'm shooting right now is 40, but I have a 55. Okay, so I'm I'm shooting the 40 right now, um, which you could kill something with that. But once I you know once I get the muscle memory, the strength, and all that stuff, and I'll pull the other one out and start shooting that. So, yeah, there's no of, there's no let off with those suckers. It's all no, no, no. 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 Uh, speaking of uh, bows, I just happened to get a new bow yesterday. Oh, I am jacked up. I've been wanting. I haven't bought a new bow since 2010, I believe. I've been shooting my Matthews Monster since 2010. Um, I got an Expedition Explorer SS. Nice. It's custom made. Um, uh, one of our team members, Jason Burcham, has been a part of uh, Expedition for years. He gets, like, the new model each year. Um, he's actually going to Darton now, um, but he got his new Darton yesterday, and he swung by the house, and I'm like, well, where's your other bow? And he's like, oh, I got it in the back seat right here. I'm like, what, what do you want to do with it? He's like, I'm probably going to sell it. I'm like, oh, I may know a guy standing here that right? may yeah. want to buy it. <laughs> uh, so I, I bought it. It's uh, it's really nice, man. I can't wait to. I, it's be, it's got a uh, um, it's got the rest on it, but I still got to put sights and all that kind of stuff on it. But it's a uh, it's a pretty slick unit. I, I'm ready to get it set up and start slinging some uh, arrows in the yard, especially because I ain't got much time left for or before August gets here. <laughs> man, you want to hear something crazy? I don't think I've ever bought a new bow. Well, my first bow, my wife bought me for Christmas back in golly, man years ago so uh but same same situation i had a guy at the fire department who shot archery he shot league and he would he every year he'd get a new bow so I'd, I'd buy a bow from him you know virtually new but you know whatever so then again as my kids got old enough i'd pass it down and i got i'd get him a bow so i bought that's how i'd get my new bows you mm -hmm. know never knew um the closest ever to new is my triax now i bought it it was it was a year old but it was new in the box guy wanted at a wild game dinner and uh i found it on marketplace and he sold it uh he didn't want it still in the box but i've wow. never bought one new from the store i mean that's kind of my, my i'm in the same boat neither yeah. one of those bows they were new to me new uh, to you. I, yeah, i've yeah, never bought like a brand new one yeah. I, I think personally um and this is just my opinion i believe the price tag on those new bows are too high um i don't think Crazy. they're worth that much money um and especially for the guys that that you know they pay Two thousand twenty one hundred bucks. They get it all set up, and then they sell it when the season's over. With you oh, yeah. know, they want another one that comes out the next year. Which I don't blame you if that's your thing and that's what you yeah. do. You do you, but I'm not spending that much money on a bow. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I love bow hunting, like it's my yeah. passion, but I'm just not spending that much money on a. Well, bow. Matthews is on to something, though, right? 
You know, oh yeah, for come, sure. Yeah, you know, they got <laughs> for sure. I'm a Matthews guy, but I don't buy a new one every year. So, <laughs> right. but that's you know, hey, like you said, if that's your thing, cool. You know. Yeah, for sure. I know Dylan's kind of in the market, and you've kind of seen them price tags too, and been like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I, I don't bow hunt avid. I I'll hunt once or twice, and then I'm done. But I love to shoot. Like I could shoot all day, every day. Um, and I just, I went to the bow shop and looked at some. And you, they're all about the same, really. You know, yeah. like, they're all going to shoot fast. They're all going to be somewhat smooth. Um, and I couldn't believe the price tag on them. You know, two grand as a naked bow. And then you have, you know, you get into modding that bow out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice things. And it's like, you know, another 200 for, you know, sights or 150 for a stabilizer. Then the quick release. And it's just like, that could... That could add up very fast. Up. I've always, I've always just bought like knew somebody selling a bow, like you guys. Yep. You know, they they were getting a new one, and I'd be like, "Hey, I'll I'll buy it." And then it sets after you know two hunts, and I'm just like, "Well, I'll sell it, and I'll get you know I'm done with bow hunting. I'll just wait until muzzleloader." And then here I am, you know, <laughs> like, done this for ten years, the same exact thing. You think I would just get one and keep it? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, I just can't do that. So I don't know. I think I may look into a recurve just for shooting. To you know, do that. They're fun to shoot, man. They're fun they shoot. are, and and then the my little one, she'll be four. You know, they've got the little bitty bows that she could shoot. Yep. Um, that is simple enough for her to to really enjoy and get out there and do with me. So I may end up doing that route and then just making one of these crossbows last this year for me, and then. Potentially, I, I might. I could see myself getting into uh, bow hunting. You know, kind of dabbling in it more. But th- this East Tennessee weather keeps me keeps me out of the woods until it cools off. It's so. tough, man. It's tough. It's yeah. hot down there. That's, it that, is. That, that is tough. So I was telling uh, Brett, you know, our, our velvet hunt, it was like 90-something last year. Oh, I know. Yeah, I'm hunting in shorts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope Blocker makes some shorts because that's what I want to have on. <laughs> yeah. I might have to use my uh, finisher pants as light as they are. Just use those. Something, man. <laughs> uh, let's talk about some deer hunting in uh, in, in Michigan. Uh, you know, kind of set it up. Like, you know, how how did you get into into deer hunting up there? Well, like like most people, my dad took me hunting for the first time. Bought me my first gun, Marlin thirty thirty lever action. Um, you know, uh, so dad introduced me to hunting. We would do the typical opener a gun, you know, over the weekend or week, mostly public land. You know, he had a friend here and there. We'd, we'd hit some private here and there, but not, never really uh, killed anything. Um, so it probably wasn't until I got out of the military. So my early 20s that I really, really got into it. Uh, killed my first deer that year with some buddies hunting some private land. Um, that was a pretty cool hunt, too. Not as cool as the bear hunt, but... Uh, it was four of us. We tent camped in mid Michigan, opener of gun, snow everywhere. Um, so we had a main tent for us. We had a tent for gear. We had like a makeshift cook station outside. So we cooked the whole time there, had a fire going the whole time, you know, to keep us warm. But uh, three out of four of us shot doe opening day. So I shot my first doe, um, shotgun zone. Um, so from there, I just got fired up with it, you know, and I had a brother that lived local that was kind of into it too. Same scenario. He, hunted with dad a little bit here and there hunted up north some never killed anything so we just started hunting um public land a lot and uh, believe it or not i was never really into bow hunting you know back then in michigan you know bow hunters could hunt from an elevated platform gun hunters couldn't and i just thought that was weird for some reason i don't know you know bow hunters up in a stand bow hunting you know whatever so not that i was resistant to it but i just wasn't interested in bow hunting really um and i didn't have friends that bow hunted kind of like turkey hunting you know if you don't know anybody or not really into it um like i said my wife bought me a bow one year for christmas and uh i was hooked from then on you know um got into bow hunting killed my first buck on public land uh first buck ever with a bow um that's kind of unique scenario so the brother i hunted with there um so i hunted I, i killed my first buck with that bow out of that stand so the following year killed my second buck out of that stand on the second day of the opener and my brother still hadn't killed a deer. So I put him in my stand two days later, he killed his first buck out of that same stand. So there was three buck in two year, two of them were our first bucks with both wow. out of that stand. 
Um, from there, you know, that's really all I really did was whitetail hunting. I didn't have a whole lot of people that I knew that did any other kind of hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, met a buddy at the fire department, got into upland bird a little bit. His dad, him and his dad had dogs. Um, had a blast doing that. Love, love hunting pheasant and chuckers. Um, like I said, I never turkey hunted. Didn't know anybody turkey hunted. I got into it a little bit here and there. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. Probably scared more turkey than, <laughs> than, than I knew. Um, it wasn't, like I said, four or five years ago through the Nexus program. Just met some outstanding turkey hunters that took me under their wing. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> And then uh, from then on, man, I just, I've been fortunate killing birds every year. Uh, killed, what, five years I've killed three double beards on her. That's insane. Right wow. That's um, insane. Just been fortunate and blessed to be with the right people at the right time, right scenario. Um, ate up with turkey hunting now. Um, when the kids started getting old enough to run around with me in the woods, I got into squirrel hunting. And this is a plug for anybody trying to figure out how to get a kid in the woods. Uh, my thought was squirrel hunting, small game, any kind of small game hunting, they can run around, they can be quiet, they can be noisy, they can step on branches, they can go out when it's not cold, um, and they love it, man. I, I would, you know, they, they learn woodsmanship, they, they, they learn deer sign, and then we're, you know, it's not just squirrel hunting, right? They're learning all kinds of stuff while they're out there, and and they had a blast chasing around, you know, we'd, I'd shoot a squirrel at fall, they'd put it in their you know, by the end of the day, their, their vest is like this, you know. <laughs> um, so I really got into small game hunting when the kids were little. And then it was crazy. I had a old high school friend that we reconnected that camped and hunted in the same area that I was hunting in. And we started doing like a squirrel hunting camp, like a week long. There would be a big group of us that would set up campers. The old timers would be cooking the whole time. And we'd be out chasing squirrel, cooking fresh squirrel over the on a pan over the fire. So I really got into small game hunting and... Uh, um, but that's really how I got into it and, and where I've ended up, you know? Um, so I spent a lot of time on private land and then it was about, let's see, I got hired on the department in 99 or no 2000. I got hired in the department the next year. There was a group of guys that was on a private lease. I didn't know what that all, I, I grew up on, you know, public land. Mm -hmm. So that next year they got me on that lease and, uh, I hunted that lease for 20 plus years, raised my three boys on that lease. They all killed their deer, their first deer on that lease, um, you know. So that's really who got me in and where I'm at with it now. So on the on the lease, kind of laid out for us. How big is it? Like train? Like so? I, it, I, I know yeah, certain parts of Michigan, Michigan are, di yeah. are different. You know, it's it's kind of like you you saw up north for the turkey hunt, five, about 500 acre ag. You know, corn, alfalfa, soybean, pretty flat for you know. It's not like Tennessee by any means. Uh, so the train is pretty even. Um, there's, you know, it, you're hunting pockets of woods, wood lines, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, uh, like I said, 500 acres. And, uh, I think there was, man, at one time, I think the farmer ended up having about 17 people on it though. So it kind of got a little over hunted a little bit over the years. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. So I hunted on that for just over 20 years. I, 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 let the least go when I moved to Tennessee and my oldest boy took my spot when I moved down to Tennessee. So mm -hmm. it sounds like they picked it up right where you guys left off. <laughs> oh man. So yeah, let me tell you, man. So that, that phone call was pretty cool. I wasn't around and I get a FaceTime from my, so rewind. So I start hunting this land and they weren't old enough to hunt. So my oldest boy becomes of age in Michigan. I think back then it was 14 um, opening day of the youth opening morning uh dad well so opening morning we get him in stand sun comes up and here comes a shooter a shooter any of us would have shot right nice eight point coming in and uh, he's got the gun and you can I, it's on film and I, you can hear me you know all right he's shoot shoot and you hear him messing with the gun and uh come on son shoot i can't shoot so all right, all right hold on gets in another shooting lane all right son shoot shoot I, i'm trying so i take the gun from him well you know, over safe, right? When I got up there, I didn't rack the gun all the way forward. Oh, so I kind of blew the opportunity for my son. <laughs> anyway, he hunt, he kills one that evening, a smaller buck. You would have thought it was bigger than that first buck, though. So he kills his first buck, his first use hunt on that piece of property. So my middle boy ages up and Michigan lowered the age limit to 12. Same stand. He's in the same stand. Opening morning, two bucks come in. Can't get a shot on it has an opportunity his first sit 
he shoots one later, like when he's 16, he shot a doe or something like that. 14, 15 shoots a doe. Um, and I'll get to that story in a minute. So then my youngest boy, Michigan, waves the age limit. And he's eight that year. And my kids grew up shooting guns. That my mm-hmm. I'm confident that he can kill at eight, you know, and it's it's a it's a parent or guardian discretion kind of thing. Right. So we take him out and he's hunting a different spot. So he shoots a doe his first time out. You know, and he's like, Dad, so so I'm the youngest to kill a deer, huh? So I have to explain to him and humble him, you know, it's Michigan, change their law, son. Don't 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 get too <laughs> cocky. <be> cocky. <laughs> but that weekend was the weekend him and his middle brother shot their first deer together. So that was kind of cool. Um, so, and I'll get to my grandson in a minute, but then fast forward to my youngest son. He's aging out of the youth hunt. He's 16, last hunt, sun's going down, camera's in the bag, right? Because it started raining, low light. He And while we're sitting there during that hunt, he looks up and he sees a tree ahead of us, got pegs screwed in it. Well, over the years I had moved, but same general area. So I'm able to share with him 20 years of hunting this spot and that tree with pegs in it is where his brother, his oldest brother shot his first deer on the first youth hunt. And now he's aging out next to that tree at 16 of his last youth hunt. And he drops a 12 point. Oh, wow. wow. Camera's in the bag. He's dad. There's a deer in the field, deer in the field. And he pulls up on it. He's I'm going to shoot. I'm going to shoot. And I get the camera up enough to the camera sideways. You can see the muzzle blast. And he drops a 12 point right there in that field. Uh, and then, so fast forward again to now my young, my oldest boy takes my lease. When I moved to Tennessee, he takes my spot and my oldest grandson turns eight and they're hunting in a ground blind over in the alfalfa field. And he drops a doe at eight years old. And I get that FaceTime of my grandson, my oldest boy and a deer. So it just came full circle, you know, from me getting this lease, growing up hunting, raising my boys on that property all of them being able to kill their first deer on that property and now my grandson kills his first deer on the same piece of property you know 20 years later you know that's freaking awesome man and it shows the traditions and the bloodlines just you know running deep man i mean that's that's an awesome story man awesome that's what it's all about man you know the the memories that probably flood when Uh, you know you just go in there and just watch the sunrise i'd say that's kind of sentimental yeah yeah i was able to go back was it two seasons ago and turkey hunt with my my oldest boy and we sat over one of the fields and that's like you said that's all like killing a turkey would have been a bonus right but just sitting in that ground blind with my adult son you know watching turkey and deer come through this field and and just the memories and it wasn't just me all those firefighter guys we all raised our kids together on that property so so the youth hunt weekend there would be probably three four five one year Seth, there was probably four or five teens that killed a buck on the youth weekend, and four of them were in velvet. Because oh, wow. in Michigan, our youth hunt is early, so you got the, the youth have an opportunity to kill a velvet deer there. And so sitting in that ground line with my son, just, you know, just the memories flowing of, of that piece of property. And, 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 I mean, that's what it's about, you know what I mean? Oh, for sure. I cannot wait to get my get my boy into it. Uh, he he hadn't got really. Oh, I, oh, absolutely. He's got he's you. shown a lot of interest. Yeah. Uh, he definitely recently of he wants to go turkey hunting next year. Uh, he wants to go turkey hunting hard. Deer isn't really his thing just yet, but uh, if he's anything like me, it'll get him just as hard as those turkeys do. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, but you made a good point with the with the squirrel stuff. I'm gonna try that. I think uh, get him yeah, out there shooting squirrels. You can do- Anything you can do to get them in the woods where they can be, you know, noisy, they can be fidgety, they can move around. It doesn't be like, like, like preseason scouting, hanging stands. My kids were hanging stands. Funny story. My kids were hanging stands with me when they were five years old. Um, my, again, my oldest boy, we're setting up a stand on public land. I am up in the tree and this is, this is probably pre lineman belt and all that stuff. So hanging I'm up there. in the tree. <laughs> I got my hands around the tree. I'm clipping in, I'm clipping the tree stand and I can't move. And the seat does this. Boom. Oh. Spit teeth out. And my son's oh, like, shit, were those teeth? Yep. Uh, but, you know, he was four or five years, five, five years old, I think he was. Um, and I hung a double set there, and I'd tie him into the tree with me. Uh, but anything you can do to get a kid in the woods, I hear people all the time, I want to take my son or daughter hunting. I want to take my son or daughter. Take them. 
Yeah. Even deer hunt. Take them, put them in a ground blind. If they blow a hunt, who cares? The biggest yep. thing yep. is make them want to come back and do it again. For sure. And don't and don't like pester or pressure them to not like it. Well, that's know? why I haven't really done it yet. He's he, he's seven. Uh, he'll turn eight uh, yeah. this fall, and that's just kind of how I am with it. I'm not going to be like, all right, get in the truck, we're going. Like, I want him yeah. to be like, hey, can I come with you sort of thing. Because even with the sports stuff, we don't pressure him into it. He, we ask him, hey, you want to play baseball again this year? Yeah, I want to play. You know, yeah. let's play. All right, I want to play basketball this year. Like, we just let him – and you you have to get them into – we we introduced him to sure. it. You know what yeah. I mean? We don't pressure him into anything. We let him be him. And I know Dylan, he does a, an amazing job with, with his two girls. I mean, what, your daughter just turned one or close to one, and she's out yeah. there riding the bobcat with him and yeah. stuff. Yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> both, yeah. Of, uh, both of my girls, I said from an early age, that's, you know, that's just what it's going to be. If they want to do it, they – they could definitely do it, but I think Maddie, she'll be four in September, and she was a month old going with me to the taxidermist, and I mean, she just, she doesn't know any other thing. She, she's out there with us, you know, building everything. She can, she can run the bobcat completely. Um, I just <laughs> sit back, and she rides and, and moves dirt for us, and um, we were doing the food plots a couple weekends ago, and uh, it hot, I mean, 90-something degrees, and I filled her up a couple buckets of water and took her up there and she threw out, she broadcasted a ton of seed out there for us. And then she went over there and she sat in the shade and she, she played in the mud. That's um, awesome. And I told her, I was like, look, if, if you want to go home, just let me know. But if you want to stay out here and get as muddy as you want, then by all means play. Absolutely. And uh, my, my, she just turned one. I've had her strapped to my chest with one of the, you know, the baby holders and she's been on, on the tractor. I'll get her out there and we'll ride around a little bit. But I, I started getting Maddie into squirrel hunting. I think she was, she could barely walk. Like she's super yeah. clumsy and I took her squirrel hunting and, uh, I guess she was two going on three and she was with me and I killed a turkey in the ground. Oh, awesome. That's and awesome, man. yeah. And now I take her, she'll go on deer hunts. Um, you know, and, and I try to time it to where like, it's not super cold sure but like yeah. you said i'll take the heater and i'll put her in the ground blind and and we end up playing more than anything you know picking yeah. up the dip yeah. and stuff like that but if you make it fun for them and, and core memories that's something they're going to hold on to and like you know that your boys killing their first deer there then seeing their you know kids kill their first deer that's going to be forever a memory absolutely that, that goes yeah. down so um yeah i think you're right man anything you can do like we'll have maddie out there with us just letting her you know we're cutting small shoot shooting lanes is what we're doing and she'll be sure. out there just moving sticks throwing riding the track we yeah. just let her, we'll be like hey what do you think about this she'll tell you i've got videos of her before we shot the velvet buck i was like where do you think we're gonna kill a deer at she pointed right up to the corner she said probably up there at that field <laughs> and then then we That's shot awesome. the velvet buck up there you know so yeah. and you talk about gonna be some killers like you know you learned yeah. you know self-taught and then you're teaching your kids so they they watch you and they're learning, um, even if you're not teaching. Sure. You know, I've learned that. Yeah. Like, just because you're not trying to explain something to them, they're they're watching and they're they're learning. So, I've been big on just trying to enjoy it, take my time, Absolutely. and in, enjoy her wanting to go. Now, I, I joke about it a little bit, but I was getting on to her the other night. I was like, "Hey, you know, you're gonna have to start listening." I'll, she's like, "Well, I'll go hunting with you." <laughs> like, oh yeah, I know what you do. Okay, doing. melt my heart. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So she, she's already playing that card. Um, yeah. but she, she, at nighttime, she'd be like, Hey, uh, tell me hunting stories. So I have to tell her hunting stories and we bought her lifetime license. So she said, That's I'm nice. fixing to send off for the little, the youngest one's lifetime license. And, and, uh, before Brett came down, you know, we were talking back and forth about getting the kids hunting. And I believe I'm exactly where you're at. Like when your kids started hunting, you, you were done, you know, you wanted to watch them oh, and all your focus went to that and I, yeah. I can feel that. So I'm excited for Brett to be able to uh, get some turkey. And, and that's just, it's a different feeling when you're watching oh, the kid, yeah. you know, go through the wood. It's, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I had, uh, um, speaking of, of not hunting when they're hunting, and my son was the one that shot the 12. He actually shot a six as his first buck. He was probably 15, 16. I don't, I don't know. And I still wasn't hunting. I was sitting with him. And at that particular time, I was filming with a uh, cell phone. 
and we're in a ground blind. It, the sun's going down, and we got a field full of dough come out. And I tell you what, this kid um, has shown some some resilience. He like he shot that first doe when he was eight, but then he didn't want to shoot a doe or a deer again until he saw a buck. He wanted to shoot a buck, wanted to shoot a buck, passing on doe, passing on doe. I mean, he's 16 years old. You know, could have <laughs> shot tons of doe. And uh, this field of doe come out, and we have one gun, and and, and he he pushes the gun over. I'm like, no. It's like your hunt. This is your hunt. A buck could come up. I don't know. He goes, Dad, I want to see you kill a deer. You know, because I've hunted with him all these years and I'm not killing anything. Yeah. So, okay, he he forces me to sh- So I drop a doe. And then the next morning, um, we hunted another spot. He was able to shoot his first buck ever. He shot a six point. So the same weekend we sh- we killed deer together. But that was another one of those hunts. He's a he's a he's a teenager now. And it was still one of those hunts where it was cold, man. It was cold as can be. Like I wanted to get down, but it's it's youth hunt trying to get him his first buck it's 9 30 in the morning sun barely up in the you know had come up and he's like damn i'm cold i want to get down it's your hunt it's your hunt what do you want to do i'm not going to make you you know like no yeah. man we'll, you know i used to tell him when they were a little hey wiggle your toes we'll sit a bit a little bit longer you know what i mean yeah, yeah. It, he's like dad it's, i'm cold hey it's your hunt if you want to get down we'll get down i don't you know it, 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 like you said it's it's memories make them want to come back for more or make them want to mm-hmm. enjoy it but uh yeah that's that's what it's all about man for and sure. you're not making him sit there and be cold. You know, if you'd have made him sit there and, and he shivered the next time, maybe he catches the forecast on the, on the weather channel. And he's like, hey, it's going to be too <laughs> yeah. cold for me to I'm go. I'm like, sit there. Yeah. 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 You know, I remember being younger and just bundling up and, and going out. And that's kind of how my dad was, you know, he, he wasn't going to make us sit there any longer than, than what we could. Cause he knew we'd probably sure. fidget too much. And, yeah. and that really, I think, you know, help not put a bad taste in my mouth for, yeah. you know, if you go out, there's going to be mornings you go out and you sit for 15, 20 minutes and you kill. I've had those and there's going to be oh, yeah. mornings Absolutely. you go out and you freeze your toes off. Yeah. You don't see anything. But some of those hunts where I've just froze all day, you know, me and my buddies have laughed in the stand or just, there's always something that you can walk out of the woods with that you didn't go in. And that's me. If you, if you, if you do it right, then you're going to build a great portfolio of just hunt to go back on. Yeah, I never get back to the truck and think, man, that was stupid. I shouldn't even went. It's <laughs> I like, wish I'd have stayed home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. There's, I never get those much. It's I always uh, appreciate my time being able to be able to hunt because there's so many people that don't get those chances like we get uh, or places to hunt. You know, like right. you said, got to hit public land or something. Then you're fighting with all these other people over a spot. And I've been very fortunate to hunt some, some places and, and with some people uh, yeah. that just, I mean, stories, you could just tell stories all night long on stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, ahead, for the public land, you know, if you oversleep a little bit, I woke up and it been 10 minutes before shooting lot. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to walk out the front door and hunt. But, you know, going back to like, you, you never are like, oh, I wish I hadn't come. But there's been mornings you probably slept in and be like, dang, I wish I'd have got up and went. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I've had several of those hunts for sure. Um, Ron, you got any um, out-of-state whitetail trips planned this year? I do. I do. So the same group that I went to Kansas with last year, and we added two to that, we're uh, going to Missouri. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe – I want to say northeastern i don't don't quote me like that we're going to an outfitter my buddies are setting it all up but i, uh, I think there's six of us going nice missouri during the rut during the rut time in november i don't have the dates i think it's, we come back i think we come back and our season opener is the 15th november 15th here so it's it's that first week or so of november right there nice uh yeah. missouri man I, I can't talk enough about that place even though i don't want to talk about it at the same time because i don't want <laughs> people to get in on it yeah. um this will be my second year second or third year i can't remember of of doing missouri we went three times last year um incredible place i, I love the That's way the, the dnr sets up everything i'm hunting public land uh when i'm over there um and i'm seeing great deer i'm seeing yeah. a lot of sign I'm not really uh, running into a whole bunch of people. Uh, I have a couple times, but it was more of my fault on where I sat compared sure. to just being pure pure numbers there. Um, the place that I hunt, they can't shoot a doe during gun season. So when gun season's in, it's not a – and when gun season's in, I'm not even hunting it anyways because I'm just bow hunting. And in Missouri, you can't bow hunt during gun season. You, okay. It goes out. Yeah. Bow season goes out. 
Um, so these people can only shoot a buck and there's, uh, antler restrictions. Got to have four point on one side for the particular County that I'm hunting. Um, and we're seeing some great deer. Uh, nice. my cousin Aaron shot a nice one, uh, there last year, uh, around the Halloween, Halloween time. Uh, we went back in November once gun season was out. Um, you could tell that it had a little bit more pressure than before. I saw about a 150, my first set there. Uh, we rolled at like six in the morning or something from here from Indiana, and I got there at like noon, uh, something like that. We didn't stop at the ho- – we, we, the first time we go for the opener, we tent camp, which is a freaking blast, cooking on yeah. the fire and that kind of stuff. Yeah. When we go back and it's cold, we stay in a hotel like 20 sure. minutes out, and uh, we didn't stop at the hotel, nothing. Went straight to the parking lot, got dressed, went out. And it's just – it's different uh, – on those out of state hunts and, and hunting yeah. public land like that. It's, it's just a whole nother feeling of excitement. Um, I feel like if you, you can't just go and sit someplace, uh, it's gotta be strategic. I feel like to put sure. yourself in the, in, in the, in the right ballpark. Um, and we've been doing that and, it, and it's been a lot of fun over there. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of how Kansas was, you know, it was my first time going out of state to, to public land. Um, and it was a good time. There was uh, four of us went. Guy shot like the second day. Uh, my buddy stuck one and couldn't find it. I think he, I think uh, the deer kind of did a funky move when he released and he kind of shouldered it. but couldn't find it. And then uh, we all saw a deer. And they, they, I guess they tell you, especially Kansas, from what I gather, if somebody kills, put somebody about, so put somebody in that stand. So my buddy killed the second day, it rested a day, and then I sat that stand for a couple of days, and I was watching a buck chase doe, man. I could not break him off them doe. Nice shooter. Um, so going into the last day, I had watched these deer where they were coming and going across the field. So, you know, hunting one-on-one, right? I'm going to move my stand, do a, a, a move. And I did. I get over there, I get set up next day. Sure enough, the door funnel in about 70 yards from me, hop the fence, right? I'll kid you not, that buck – came across the field on the other side of the field and went down in the riverbank where my stand was. Oh, fuck. But that's not, you know what yeah, I mean? It, it's going to make me go back to Kansas again. But that was that was cool. We had, a, like, a nice Airbnb <coughs> cabin. Um, uh, it was a good time. Like I said, we all saw deer. Had opp- a couple of us had opportunities. Uh, we applied for points this year because we're doing Missouri, uh, and we'll get back to Kansas once we get a couple points to get a, probably a different area. And then that same group of guys we put in for, we started putting in for Iowa. Um, once we have enough points, we're going to try to draw Iowa. Uh, so. so how are you prepping for these hunts? Are, are you e-scouting, talking to, you know, somebody yeah, who's so there? Just- I, so our group had never been to Kansas, but two of the guys know a group that have been. So they were try, try, trying to get as much information as those guys would give, right. I guess, without dropping yeah. pins. Uh, and then e-scouting before we got there. And then we got there earlier than we anticipated. So we went right in, scouted, and hung stands. And then um, we didn't want to sit on stands too long. You know what I mean? Like we scout, find signs, sat in some stands, and then kind of tweaked from there. Um, I sat on my stand probably a little too long because I was seeing deer. Um, but no. So I, that's when I made the move out of my stand. And then my buddy had sat and then moved that that second day was a good move because he killed. Um, yeah. yeah, pretty pretty much just e-scouting, um, talking to guys that have been there, trying to get as much info as they would be willing to give, and then just hit the ground when you get there. It is. It's hard to, like, go to some place new and not know exactly how it lays because, you know, e-scouting can be a little bit different. Um, yeah. Once you get there and see eyes on it, you know, maybe it's been cut before. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You it's know, hard. So it, it plays a different fact. You know, it's, it's it's frustrating, but it's 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 neat though. You know what I mean? It's a good time. Yeah, for sure. It kind of takes you back to the age of hunting before trail cameras, but right Absolutely. because you don't know what's coming through there. You don't know how you know your imagination can can go wild. So that comes sure. back to those squirrels hopping through. You know, your heart starts yeah. beating real fast. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that that would be an absolute blast. Um, I've actually thought about a couple of my farms not running any cameras and just going in. I may not run them this year at all, I don't, but I don't really have anywhere to hunt right now either. So, Yeah. I did that two years ago uh, on one of my honey holes here, didn't run cameras, and it, was, it wasn't it was really on purpose. I, I was really busy with work, like 
just couldn't even hardly get time to do anything. Uh, and I ended up killing a giant there. Didn't know – kind of one of those things like – had I known – there was actually another deer there that was bigger, but I didn't know it until after season. After I killed the one that I killed, I ended up putting some cameras out, just wanted to see what was there. I was curious. Ended up being a, another one that was bigger there. I mean, they were both pretty big, but, like, having that excitement of not really knowing what was there yeah. made me play it a, li- a lot different. Had I known – that the other one was there, I probably wouldn't have shot him just because sure. he was such a I – mean, he's a 180, 185, somewhere in there. I mean, it, would you shoot a 130 or a 180? You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, it, it just would make your – your my decisions, my split-second decisions would have been a lot different, but I wouldn't I wouldn't change a thing. Could, could change the way you hunt completely. You know, like if the yeah, wind sure. would have been a different direction, you knew he was in there, you may have done a whole different thing. And it, it kind of takes some of the magic away um, – because you you get so many pictures of these deer as they grow and you can literally look at them and know which deer it is at you know 100 yards and i think that i think i might not run any cameras um you know i pulled mine down the other day to change batteries and not really put them back out yet but i'm torn on a heart attack i know it's hard once you start you know, but then you rely so much on those cameras sometimes. And I don't, you know, last year I was like, let's, let's just get this big buck. Cause I was watching him grow. And I got, I got super addicted to checking my camera every day to see what he was doing. And it, it paid off, but you know, there, it had been nice to just be in there and not know, you know, what he had been doing yeah. consistently and the element of surprise kind of fire up for you. But, I wouldn't change it. I'm going to run some cameras for Brett on yeah, some of the spots. I'm going to have some of the spots. I'm going to put him. Now, I do Wrestling, have. Yeah, run cameras. Run cameras. <laughs> run at I least do, one, please. <laughs> I do have uh, a couple um, really good bucks already. As of three weeks ago, he was already at six point flirting outside his ears. Um, and I was telling Brett, we don't really get a lot of growth until mid-July, yeah. you know, and then they hard horn probably mid August is when they start hardening up and, and the growth kind of dies down. But I've studied their growth heavy. I have poured out enough mineral to grow every buck in the county <laughs> <laughs> on some good size. So it's just counting down and, and I'm you know, for Brett to come down, I'll be honest, I probably won't set but once or twice that weekend when you come yep. down. Mm-hmm. Um I'm gonna get Brett in there and I'm gonna see if we can't knock him down a good velvet buck because awesome. I, so I get more excited to see my friends shoot. Oh man, or, I'm telling you. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, just... it's almost better for me because, you know, I put in a lot of work. So to see somebody else enjoy that work is really what I, at this point, that's kind of what I'm going for until yeah. my kids get old enough. I just want to, you know, hook my buddies up and, and have good hunts. And I've got Brett one, one hell of a spot set up. And then nice. I've been scouting this other, it's the, a huge valley that comes down into this and it's just super shaded that it looks like a highway in there um mm. because it, it's kind of thick on both sides and you get down in there and like this, this big flat swell and they're just burning it up and i think they're just staying down in there during the summer because of the heat yeah you know, it stays cool heat, oh absolutely absolutely so i've got him a tree picked out and uh we're gonna we're gonna see if that won't work and then i have a couple other spots so we're gonna i'm gonna let him bounce around when he comes down i'm gonna let him kind of go We'll analyze what they're doing, and, and I, you're coming to what for the full three days? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll, I'll probably come in Thursday night after work or yeah. something. Might be so, a little bit later, but it'll I'll be, probably try to get that same Airbnb that I had. Uh, it's not too far away from you, even though you know, with it being that hot, I might rent a houseboat or something. No That'd be real nice, <laughs> right? So you definitely on tent camp during that. That you'd sweat. No, no that would be pretty bad. Uh, but that but kind we, of brought me thinking about that. You know, talking about the out of state hunts and like me going down there and stuff like that. What do you do as far as equipment goes uh, on your out of state hunts? Are you like a lock on saddle climber? What do you use? Uh, so this this for Kansas, we all there were three of us. We got set up with uh, the XOP, the mm-hmm. running gun XOP sets, and then Absolutely. another buddy had uh, something from a local guy here in Michigan. Uh, I, I don't even remember the name of it. It probably wouldn't know it if I if I knew. So pretty much uh, lock on, um, and we you know what we bought those brackets, so you could just hang the bracket, slide it in, and then but we never used them. I bought three of them, never used them because they were so much easier just to tear down and, and move. 
Um, I'm, I sat in a saddle at the last ATA show I was at. I'm, I'm leaning towards maybe trying one, uh, mm-hmm. especially if I get back into doing some public land hunting here. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause I think it would be a little bit easier and quicker if I could, you know, wear the saddle in and not have to deal with hanging the stand. I know you got the platform and all that stuff with the saddle, but I don't know. So right now it's the XLP is I've got four sticks. I get plenty high enough with those four sticks. If I need to, I can add an eighter to one of the sticks and get a little bit higher, but I, I'm getting plenty high enough with, with the setup I, I have back. Actually, it's, I used it in Canada too, um, as my set. And then I hung above me. I hung just another hang on for Chris to film from, but yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I, I, my platform for my saddle, uh, is XOP. My sticks are the XOP X twos, which no. I would highly recommend those sticks to anybody light. that's any type of game. They're so light. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're incredible sticks. They're the best sticks I've ever used. And then actually just a couple of days ago, I got a new XOP lock on. I just want another tool. Uh, yeah, to use, you know what I mean? Uh, I got the, the vanish evolution or something like that. I think it's around nine, nine, ten pounds. Yeah. I really wanted the cold war, whichever one was like seven pounds. I really wanted that one, but I, I, I want to start doing it with this. I'm doing the run and gun setup with the, the back, back, back straps and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think that's what I'm going to take down to Dylan's. I, I'll probably take my saddle, um, just in case I go someplace that, I hadn't put a lock on in yet or something like that. Or if it's like, Hey man, I saw a buck run across the road in here yesterday on my way to work or something like that. It's like, I'll go in there after him, you know, or something like that. It's just nice to have all those type of tools. You know, know, I may already have a, like I was telling uh, my, we had kind of a blue river bow hunting cookout sort of on Sunday. We had several people over and just talking hunting and stuff. And um, I may buy another, another XOP. I may have like three or four of them just to be able to run wherever. And, and, and I'm probably going to buy a couple more sets of sticks because I may have uh, on my Hancock County property, I may have two, two lock-ons and then I may just carry the sticks in or, or, or it, it just, there's so many combination of things that you can think of, but I just want to have so many tools to be able to pull it off. Yeah. I get I get pretty deep in all that stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> XOP guys, should give me a sponsorship at this point. You guys run camper tops or anything while you're traveling for hunting? Um, I know when I had a camper top on my Super Duty, that thing was amazing just because you could get everything in there. It was in the dry, and you had all the room in the cab. Um, you know, especially if you had buddies going with you. Um, yeah. I don't have a bed cover or a camper top yet, but I'm seriously thinking about getting another one just because of those road trips. I know we just came back from a bow fishing trip and having a camper top would have been amazing as far as coolers, gear, bows, cause you can lock it, not have to worry about, you know, moving stuff from the bed of the truck back into the cab. I have a bed cover. It, thank God. And my, yeah. my tailgate lock. So that, and, but I just got, uh, you know, I had my Ford F-150 for years. Um, it kind of took a crap on me and we got the, the, the wife, a pretty nice car. And I kind of, uh, relied on some buddies the last year or so when it comes to trucks. And then, oh, daddy finally got him one a couple nice. weeks ago. I got me a 2019, uh, Dodge Ram big horn edition. Uh, it's, it's feels good to be back in a, in a bit mm-hmm. in a pickup. So I can only imagine what I'm going to get into. I'm actually thinking about getting like the, the decking system where I can just pull it out and there's drawers yeah. and they just Those have a nice. drawer. It was super nice. I'm thinking about diving in and getting one. Yeah, my last truck had a camper top on it, and I I just replaced that truck, and I didn't think I'd miss it as much as I do, but I do. I got a tonneau cover for this, and I wish I wouldn't have spent the money on a tonneau cover mm-hmm. because I, I missed the camper top. Like you said, you can put everything you want in there, lock it all down. Like like Vic got a new truck, too, and he got a new camper top right before we went to, to bear camp, and good thing because there was you know three of us in his truck, and we could just put everything we needed to put in there, lock it down, and had all the room in the cab that we needed, you know. Uh, yeah. I knew a guy. Oh, he uh right. he he took the camper top right, but he put he made this. I guess it was plywood, maybe. Yeah. And he would put the plywood down, and then put the camper top on top of the plywood, and he had cutouts to work it. And he put an air mattress on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, yeah. then he, that. he had almost like a built-in deck system, you know, that yeah. he had made himself. So all of his gear, everything like that, was under him. He could lock. You know, he had the he had sliding windows. 
And he was like, I don't worry about camping at public spots anymore because I'm literally Just sleeping sleep right in there. I've yeah, seen uh, some stuff. elaborate setups in that. They're like they they put like some of those lights in that just run on batteries that you can just click them and, you know, mm-hmm. turn them on. And they're in there yep. making, you know, with a um, Milwaukee setup, making coffee in the morning oh, in, the yeah. in their truck. Yeah. You know? Like you oh, can yeah. get pretty deep in, in setups like that, which when we go to uh, Missouri uh, for their opener and we tent camp, I enjoy the tent camping because oh, yeah. you can camp pretty much anywhere on public land. Um, it does kind of get sketchy sometimes leaving your tent. You know, I, I, sometimes I have like my, um, uh, my, uh, scent lock bags and stuff like in the corner of my tent, probably not the smartest idea. I probably should have put it back in the truck, not thinking, trusting people way too much, sure. but, uh, just that, it, that, that feeling is a little bit different of a uh, hunting in a camp. Like, I mean, we're literally walking from camp right, right. out the back into, into the woods. See, I, just, I like that. That feeling yeah. is pretty fun, man. I like that. Well, buddy, I appreciate you taking the uh, the time out of your schedule, uh, especially working seven twenty fours. I'm sure you're pretty yeah. wore out, and I appreciate yeah. your time and coming on. Had a blast talking with you, buddy. Well, thanks, thanks for having me on, on, man. I appreciate it. Tell uh, tell everybody where they can uh, find you and uh, Crimson Trail on the old social media. Well, uh, me Facebook, if you can find me, because there's a lot of common names out there. But Ron Howard, uh, also uh, Rustic Fireman. Um, do a little bit of woodworking you can check me out on there um instagram rustic fireman um crimson trail you can find us on uh facebook you can find us on um, carbon tv it's a free app you can download and uh watch us for free on carbon tv well i appreciate it, buddy uh we'll be back again uh next week for uh episode 86 down we're getting awfully close to that hundred mark we're gonna have to figure out something pretty special for the hundred mark i wonder i wonder if the hundred could be something when you're down here huh it could probably be pretty close oh, to that time cool. period that would be yeah. pretty cool i could just bring the whole setup down yeah that'd be pretty sweet that would be pretty that'd sweet be cool. might be something we have to get into but uh we'll see everybody uh well go check us out on uh youtube uh spotify anywhere you can find the podcast we're there Go give us a like and subscribe, and uh, we'll see you back here again next week for uh, episode 86.